Hello, my name is Duncan Gromko, and I'm working with Lincoln at Unique. I'll present today our second case study on Lake Chomo, which is located in the southern nations area of Ethiopia. Lake Chomo is located very near Lake Abaya, and combined, these two lakes make up um, a very big tourist attraction within the country, especially because of the dramatic and contrasting colors between the two lakes. So Lake Abaya has received so much erosion during the yes, last years that it is nearly entirely silted over, which has basically killed the, the very important fisheries within the lake. And unfortunately, Lake Chamo is facing very similar threats. And we wanted to understand um, what, will be, what we're concerned about, what are the effects of fisheries and tourism from um, this increasing erosion. Um, a little background on the area. So there are, there are three different rivers that feed into Lake Chamo, Elgo, Sila, and Kulfo. Um, for this study, we were just looking at the, the Elgon catchment area. It goes from a low elevation near the lake, a kind of delta area near the lake, um, increasing in elevation, and then even very high areas of nearly 1,500 um, meters. Um, now, it's also a quite a rugged, uh, rugged area with um, steep slopes. In terms of the, the land uses, the, the primary land use in the area is agriculture. This is about 20,000 hectares. Now there's also some grazing area and also some forested area. Now, so with, with, with this kind of background, our cost benefit analysis wants to look at what can we do in order to reduce erosion coming into the lake? Um, and what would be the costs of this kind of investment and what would the different benefits be? Very similar to what Lincoln presented in Madagascar. So to start with, we made a model of what is the current land cover. So now this, this image on the right is our, our map, our projected current land use within the lake, uh, the, sorry, the, the Elgo catchment area. So the, the mapping was done based upon parameters that we set up of slope and elevation, plus our own experience doing interviews in, in, in the area. Um, the map is created using GIS and analysis. So what I mean here is it's not it's not the case that the map is built with observed data. This is model data based on the slope, based on the elevation, based on our experience in the region. We have modeled the land use. So it's not the case that um, each pixel in this map is is accurate. That there's going to be TEF on every pixel where we've said that there's TEF. Rather, this is more or less going to be an approximation of what land use in the in the region is. And basically what we've done yeah, is modeled um, different agriculture types, grazing types, and forest areas within, within the catchment area. Then in order to do a similar cost benefit analysis as what Lincoln presented, we made a second map. Where here we've projected land use under our project scenario. If we made different investments in reducing erosion, what would the land use be? So basically we've set up three different types of of uh, project investments. The first is protecting existing forests. So in the, the green areas, you can see what forests remained and what would be protected. Basically, we're assuming that by um, by enforcing cur current land land use laws, we can reduce deforestation. The second um, investment measure would be forest restoration. So this is actually planting trees. Um, now, especially we're going to be planting trees in areas where forest has been deforested and then also along waterways. So that's why in the very light green, you can see this, this snaking color coming from the lake on the right and moving to the west, that's, that's the river. And basically it's light green because we're assuming that we're planting all along the side of the river. And then the last and most important measure that we've introduced is soil erosion protection measures on agricultural lands. So these are especially stone buns and bench terraces. Now, just so you know, for the for the purposes of our modeling, what we've assumed is that our implementation rate is successful at about 50 percent. So we assume that we're only, you know, we might introduce these measures on the entire landscape, but that it's only taken up at a 50 percent rate. So based on all this, we, you know, we've done very similar to what to what Lincoln Lincoln presented. We developed one hectare models for a, a base case land use scenario and then one hectare models for um, our project or investment case scenario. So based on this, what we found is that there's um, the, the baseline scenario has a net present value of about $91 million, and the project scenario has a NPV of about $106 million. And this gives an indication that the, the project scenario is more profitable than the baseline scenario. Um, the, I'd say the most important finding um, from our study is that the benefits 
primarily came from agricultural productivity. What we found is that by introducing terracing and by introducing stone buns, you can really dramatically increase um, on-site agricultural productivity. And this is leading to by far the, the, the majority of the benefits that we've calculated. Now, there are also off-site benefits in terms of reducing soil erosion that's coming into the lake. So this is expressed in the 28,000 tons of avoided sedimentation per year. However, we, were, we, we decided not to try to monetize, um, i.e. to put a monetary value on the benefits from reducing sedimentation coming into the lake. We did that one because we thought it would be highly uncertain and we didn't think that um, with the, the small amount of time that we had that we could accurately model this. But most importantly, we, we saw that compared to the agricultural, the impacts on agriculture and the, those total economic impacts, the, the benefits from fisheries or the benefits from tourism were relatively small. So kind of the, yeah, we didn't think that the, the additional time spent to, to model that would be, would be worth it in terms of changes to the model. Um, so then aside from the, the very local benefits of agricultural product productivity and the more regional benefits uh, on tourism and fisheries, we also looked at international benefits in terms of climate change mitigation. So we found that about 17,000 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent could be sequestered per year. Now, in this case, we decided not to monetize that. It would be quite easily to estimate a monetary value per ton and estimate so therefore a total economic value of climate change mitigation. But in this case, we thought that tons would be a more effective indicator for communicating the value in terms of climate change mitigation. Um, with that, that's basically presenting the, the, the second case study. Um, I can also provide then very quickly my thoughts on, you know, sort of our, our own learning, our own analysis from doing the methodology and the two different case studies. Um, so first is that, uh, you, know, you know, these two geographies that we looked at were very distinct. We're looking at Madagascar in a mangrove area and then Ethiopia in a highland area with agriculture. Um, and the methodology is meant to be so flexible that we can we can apply it in different geographies and then also with very different economic activities. I'd say the second major um, lesson that we had from it that we well we did the assessments in, in rather a quick amount of time. Um, but nonetheless, we, we were able to reasonably estimate that the, the projects can be economically beneficial. And especially that we're able to distinguish between benefits that happen at the local level in terms of, um, you know, direct local incomes for people living there uh, at the regional level, protecting environmental resources that result in economic benefits. And finally, we estimate benefits at the international level in terms of climate change mitigation. Uh, a third learning is that doing the cost benefit analyses, they helped us to, um, we, we learned lessons about how the, the project design could be could be better um, implemented. So in just for example, in the case of the Lake Chamo Ethiopia case study, we found that since most of the benefits are happening um, related to agricultural productivity, if the product if the project is going to be successful, then project implementers should really be focusing on um, maximizing or ensuring on-site benefits. So in this way, the cost benefit analysis can help a project implementer to design the project better. And then just a, a final lesson um, is that both studies were done with relatively small budget. And that I'd say that um, this means that there's, you know, a fairly high degree of uncertainty from, from, from the studies. So despite this uncertainty, I, you know, I think I feel quite confident that, that more or less these, these results are, you know, in the right direction. They're, they're, they're the correct magnitude. But if you really wanted to have a higher level of certainty, um, numbers that you felt were very accurate, very precise, then and, and you know you might want more precise numbers if you're going to come in and make a large investment. Then I then I would think that um, uh, project designers might want to invest a little bit in doing and spending more time on a cost benefit analysis if more accurate numbers are needed. 